Well, hello everyone. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good evening. Um, welcome to Lifelong Scholar Society Lecture. I have a few housekeeping items I want to let you know that if you go out these doors to the right are the restrooms and we have some refreshments in the back of the room for you to enjoy. So help yourself. Um, tonight's talk is The Bucktail in Florida, A Tiny Russian Canoe's Journey Through Time. And before we start, I want to introduce Dr. Michael Grace. Since 1999, Dr. Grace has served as faculty in biological sciences and as an administrator for the College of Engineering and Science. A behavioral neuroscientist, his work was centered on vision and related sensory systems in whales, snakes, giant marine fish, and other fascinating animals with the goal of understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms of vision and developing biometric artificial sensors. Dr. Grace also built and ran Florida Tech's High Resolution Microscopy Center. Away from campus, he has been a lifelong outdoorsman, collector, and restorer of historic small boats. Widely published on history of wooden boats, he currently serves as president of the International Wooden Canoe His Heritage Association and a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and study of wooden boat history. Has up here a sample of his boat. So, with that, Dr. Grace, the floor is yours. Welcome. <clears throat> All righty. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And uh, first of all, I bet uh, you all already knew about the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association, right? <laughs> Probably most of you are members, I'm guessing. But uh, so um, I'm not really a, a very loud speaker, and I tend to wander. If, if, it, if you can't hear, let me know, and I'll come back closer to the microphone. I'm told, though, that if I get too close, it'll blast you out of your seats. So, so tonight... Um, is uh, this will be informal. I want to just have a conversation, a chat. And what I thought I would do is start off by telling you a little bit about my history and how I come to this from what you just heard. And, um, and then there's a, a video that my son and I put together about this little boat and its history. Uh, this is one small piece of my addiction that some people call uh, with, with small antique boats. Um, and then anyway, once this is done, this will be about 24 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we can have some discussion, um, any questions you might have. Sound good? Yeah. All right, so, um, so yes, oh, and by the way, this is a snake hook, just in case. This is one of my other avocations. I couldn't find a laser pointer, so <laughs> I grabbed this out of the truck. Um, so, yes, um, I've been on, I was on faculty here at Florida Tech for, for quite a few years. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, like most faculty at Florida Tech, you know, we tend to work on things that are technological in nature, of, you know, in some way. And so I, I worked on sensors with the goal of building better artificial sensors, uh, uh, studied sensory systems with goals of, of finding new ways to prevent blindness, um, worked on other systems uh, with the goal of, of trying to find uh, better methods to treat difficult to, he to heal wounds, for example. Um, but all that time, I, I always I have other passions in life, and I, can't, I, I never can focus on just one thing. So when I would get home in the evenings, on the weekends, anytime I could get away, I would always find something to do either outdoors or with wood. Um, and all of this actually stems from my childhood. I grew up as a very shy, really an introverted kid. And I guess I still am. Um, in fact, I actually, I was thinking earlier today that really is kind of the theme here is uh, never growing up. You know, I still play with boats. I still love to be outdoors. I still play with snakes, um, all these good things. But um, when I was young, um, even around family, you know, it was my immediate family. Of course, that's fine. But, but we would have these big family reunions. And they were on a lake. And... Um, all the aunts and uncles and cousins, and we only had this reunion once a year, and I couldn't remember all these people, and I certainly couldn't remember their names, and so for a kid like me, it was a little difficult to go to these reunions and be expected to perform, in a sense, for all these people, you know, remember who they were and remember what they said a year ago, and so under the house was an old aluminum, a Grumman canoe, if you remember those, 
chained up, and I would rummage around in the junk drawer and find the key and unlock that boat. And even as a little kid, I'd drag this big 17-foot canoe down to the water, and I'd disappear. I made sure to get back in time for the big meal, and then I would disappear again afterwards, just out on the lake by myself. Um, not, still as a young person, as an 11-year-old, I joined Boy Scouts, and the very first merit badge I earned um, within a week of my 11th birthday was the canoeing merit badge. And I grew up um, in the Deep South. I spent a lot of time canoeing in the Okefenokee and on rivers um, across the Deep South, uh, as far north as Kentucky and Tennessee, and just really, really enjoyed it. Um, when my wife and I were uh, in, in college, we, we were both, we were trying to put ourselves through school for, for different reasons for the two of us, but we didn't have any extra money. We actually, I was thinking the other day how we would go to the grocery store with a $20 bill for the two of us, and that was a week's worth of groceries, and we did not go beyond it, and we did not eat out. So we didn't have any extra money. I always wanted to buy a canoe, couldn't afford it. Um, when I graduated, I, I did my undergrad at Georgia Tech. When I graduated, I had a few months before I started uh, grad school at Emory, and I happened to see an old wooden canoe during that time frame. And I tell you what, I fell in love. The beauty of that thing. I mean, it looked alive. It's got these ribs inside. It really, it reminded me of an animal, and I love animals anyway. So it, it just had this skeleton and this, this, this rich, beautiful, varnished wood. And it was a canoe, and I could get out and escape. Um, it, was, it just really captivated me. Couldn't find one. Looked for years. Tried and tried to find one. So at some point, I bought the cheapest little table saw you could buy, and a few other tools, and a few big hunks of red cedar, and started sawing up wood and built my own. We still have it today, we still use it today. Um, but a few years after that, I got the bug to find an old one again, and I finally found one, and that was, uh, my wife might say, the beginning of the end, or my downfall, or, or maybe her downfall. Because now our, even our home is filled with these things, filled with canoes, filled with canoe-related memorabilia, and not just canoes, other small boats, sailboats, and things like that, but all old, all very historic. We have two or three that are maybe from the 60s or so, but that's, those are babies compared to the others. So with that said, what I want to do is tell you the story of this particular one. This was a, a really fortuitous find. Um, Found it totally by happenstance back in 2019 here in Florida. And when I saw this tiny grainy photo, I said, that is something special. It was black at the time with this aged dark varnish. And I, I think I know who the builder is. I think it's a builder named J. Henry Rushton from Canton, New York, based on just you know how it was built. And it turned out to be true. And the more I looked into it, the more I found that it had a really fascinating story. And so what this is, is, a, is a, a, a story about primarily the man that it was built for and what he used it for. He used it for a, a wonderful adventure here in Florida back in the winter of 1885. And that adventure, and because he was a very famous writer already, that adventure and his publication of a series of stories about it made him and the builder even more famous than they already were. And both of them in this world are still very famous today. Rushton canoes are the most sought after, canoes and boats are the most sought after wooden boats there are in the world today. And the paddler, whose pen name was Nestmuck, is still widely read today, more than a century after both of them were gone. So with that, we will, I'll show you this video. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you up front, this is, uh, this, my son did a wonderful job of narration. Just go. And, um, yeah. We think it'll go. The Bucktail in Florida. Act 2, 136 years later. My outing is over. The canoes hang idly in their slings, and my beautiful summer is past. I have a sad, October-like presentment that it may be my last. These were the gloomy words of George Washington Sears, worrying in the fall of 1884 
that he might not see another summer. Sears, under the pen name Nesmuk, had just published the book Woodcraft, a book he surely didn't expect would remain continuously in print for at least the next 135 years. He was also a very popular writer for Forest and Stream, the most widely read outdoors-oriented periodical of the day. But despite his growing popularity, Nesmuk himself, a small man at 5 foot 3 inches tall and 103 pounds, was suffering from tuberculosis and asthma. He looked to the outdoors and to quiet solo adventures to restore his health and vitality, and he did just that through the past summer. I said last March that for one season, I would devote my energies as a woods loafer to home woods, waters, and mountains. And I've pretty well done it. He recounts paddling through northern Pennsylvania, right up until a drought dried up the river to such an extent that it was better wheelbarrowing than canoeing. Passing July on New York's Fulton chain of lakes, not lamenting at all for cityscapes, Nesmuk said of his near eggshell Rushton canoe, I've paddled the Sari Gamp on the first four lakes until my arms are lame. Sitting in her this afternoon, I took in six fine trout. She yields to the rush of a 13-inch speckle like a split of bamboo. For a ten and a half pound canoe, she is a marvel of steadiness. I ride in her in pretty rough water without a wiggle. I shall try no lighter one, however. She makes a good sideshow wherever she appears, but a larger canoe would be more comfortable, say 18 pounds. The canoe was Nesmuk's means of escape. He didn't cry for the urban sprawl he left behind, but rather said, I shall be glad to miss the blistering, seething city. And then he went on in verse. For brick and mortar breed filth and crime, and a pulse of evil that robs and beats. And men are withered before their prime, by the curse paved in with lanes and streets. And lungs are poisoned, and shoulders bowed, in the smothering wreck of mill and mine, and death stalks in on the struggling crowd, but he shuns the shadow of oak and pine. As much as he left his northern woods, at the end of the season and each of the last few years, Nesmuk became nostalgic for warmer days and wilder places, depressed at the onset of the northern autumn and fretting the onset of each new winter. During one trip by rail back to his Pennsylvania home, he stared out the train windows, lamenting the many ways man profits from nature at her expense. The coming of winter and the incessant encroachment of man left Nesmuk with a bleak outlook. And so it was that during the winter of 1884 into 1885, he somehow lifted his spirits and planned a completely different kind of adventure. Looking forward to brighter days, he wrote, It was December last that I received a letter from Captain S.D. Kendall, in which he said, Hello, Nesmuk. What's got you? Are you coming? The thermometer was then marking 20 degrees below zero at my northern home. I was sick in body and spirit, and it was impressed on my mind that the raw, slushy months of February and March were destined to wind up my cruising unless I could reach a more genial climb. And I said, yes, I am coming. I cannot say when or how, but sometime, somehow, I will get there. Pick me out a high, dry camping ground, well shaded by live oaks. Captain Samuel D. Kendall, Nesmick's correspondent and future host, was another avid outdoorsman and writer of the day well known to the readers of Forest and Stream. He was a man who literally paddled his way to Florida, and then couldn't bring himself to leave. In 1881, Kendall and Dr. Charles A. Needy, another avid canoe adventurer and an officer of the American Canoe Association, paddled together from Lake George, New York to Pensacola, Florida on the Gulf of Mexico. But in a note to Forest and Stream, Kendall pointed out the full extent of his journey. 
My cruise did not commence at Lake George, and it did not end at Pensacola. I put my canoe in the water at Wells River, New Hampshire, cruised to Lake George by way of the Connecticut River, Long Island Sound, Hudson River, Champlain Canal, and rail from Fort Edward. I, after being joined by Dr. Needy, continued on my cruise via canals and rivers to the Gulf. Dr. Needy cruised with me as far as Pensacola, where we separated, he returning north, and I continued my cruise, going as far south as Clearwater Harbor, which would add some 500 miles after Dr. Needy left me. So I want you guys to think about this. This is 18, I forget, 1884, when they did this cruise. 1884, in canoes, these two men went all the way from New York, or really New Hampshire, down to the Gulf, and then Captain Kendall, by himself, went all the way around the Gulf, from Pensacola all the way down to here. Amazing stuff. I mean, there's nothing out there except things that want to eat you during those days. At the time Kendall landed on the west coast of central Florida, much of the landscape was subtropical jungle. It was a wild and unforgiving place, just the thing to set imaginations adrift in adventurous canoeists. Kendall chose to stay, settling along the northern bank of the Anclody River, just west of the future village of Tarpon Springs. Under the pen name Tarpon, Kendall wrote in the September 20, 1883 issue of Forest and Stream, The canoe-loving readers of your paper cannot find a prettier spot for a week or a month's cruise than the west coast of Florida, anywhere between the Cedar Keys and Punta Rasa. It has all the great requisites for that most healthful of all sports, open waters, bays, creeks, and lagoons, freshwater lakes and streams, fish, oysters, and game in abundance, and good camping grounds almost anywhere. I wanted to point out, um, I, I really enjoy photography, and so some of the photos you've seen so far weren't taken here in Florida, obviously, but um, I think everything in here except for one, well, the, non, the historic ones aren't mine, but everything else is except for one. And what I want you to know is anything that you see that, that looks like this, I actually took this canoe once it was restored to the very place where this adventure happened. And so all of the photos that you'll see of sort of Florida landscapes, they are right there where he paddled this canoe back in the 1800s, 1885. So what you just heard about, uh, he, Captain Kendall was saying there's no better place to be than this area between Cedar Keys, Cedar Keys, plural, and Punta Rasa. He's just really waxing nostalgic about his new home on the west coast of Florida. So Kendall came down and cruised all the way down to that area and spent a little time. He, he became a boat builder in that area of the west coast of Florida, just north of, uh, in Tarpon Springs, just north of Tampa. Um, but, but the real story is going to be about his friend, Nesmuk, the one you saw earlier with the beard and the hat, who came down to join Kendall and spent the winter of 80, 1885, and all of his adventure was in and around the area that's now known as Tarpon Springs. Nesmuk, winter-weary and ill of health, took the bait, gathered his own fishing and hunting gear and a favorite canoe, and planned to head south. His next outing was celebrated even as it began. Clearly Nesmuk was held in high regard as an outdoorsman, because on the January 22, 1885, the unjaded editors wrote on the front page of Forest and Stream, top of the center column, Nesmuk found his way into Forest and Stream last week. He was on his way to Florida and accepted the shelter of a tin roof during a rainstorm in the city and pending the arrival of his bucktail canoe. Putting into practice the preachings of woodcraft, he was going light. The ditty bag and four jackknives completed the equipment. The hatchet had been stowed in his sea chest, somewhat unfortunately too, for lost on the devious ways and intricacies of the stairways and hall passages by which this office is reached, the old woodsman's instinct was strong to blaze a trail. The muzzle loader too was stored in his chest, but we had the pleasure of inspecting the powder horn, the loading tools, and other duffel of the ditty bag. Nesmuk is brimful of mother wit and wisdom. 
His story magazine is set with a hair trigger and never a misfire. The editors in Nesmic traded stories long past midnight, and despite Nesmic's age, 64 years at the time, and his reported frailty, the editors declared, The portrait in Woodcraft is a libel. Wrinkles there shown are not to be discovered in Nesmic's countenance, and may they not be put there by his Florida cruisings. Nesmic's canoe of choice for his Florida adventure was the bucktail, ten and a half feet of lapstrake cedar, designed and built by J. Henry Rushton in his Canton, New York workshop. With a beam of 26 inches and a depth of ten and a half inches, the little canoe could handle 300 pounds on a six-inch draft. Priced around $30, the bucktail was delivered with a double paddle and a drop-in folding seat. Nesmic was truly enamored by a beautiful canoe. During one northern excursion as he lay in camp, Nesmic gazed at his little canoe moored loosely in the water and remarked poetically, The bucktail swings airily to her moorings, even as a thing of life. Never quite still, no matter how quiet the water, resting on the glassy surface like an eggshell, and always in graceful motion, but so gently, so softly, that at times she seems motionless. I make it a point to moor a canoe where I can lie idolantly on a bed of brows, smoke, and watch the graceful motion of the little craft as by imperceptible degrees she takes in every point of the compass. And while engaged in this laudable occupation, it happens that I forget all about it. The pipe tumbles onto the blanket, and I unconsciously drop off into a sweet, healthy, unpremeditated sleep. And so, Nesmuk headed south. In his first installment of what would become an eight-part series of stories in Forest and Stream, Nesmuk described his decision this way. One year ago, while suffering severe trouble with respiratory organs, I said that another winter must find me south of the snow belt, or I might as well throw up the sponge. I hated to do that. The world, even the northern world, seemed so bright and green in the summertime. Bright lakes, ponds, and rivers to cruise, such sweet cold springs and lovely camping grounds to take in. I felt like asking the Grim Rider to go a little slow on the track for a few years, and I turned my thoughts to Southern California and the Gulf thereof. With his health somewhat restored by his canoe cruises of the summer, and early autumn of 1884, Nesmik still worried about the upcoming winter, noting that far too many people meet sickness and death from January through May in this northeastern United States. But the Gulf of California? Nesmik worried, The bucktail turns her beautiful nose up, more in fear than in anger, at the broad waters and crested waves. Her skipper is unwilling to swamp her in rough water, miles from land. And the wind offshore, how could she make the beach? It was about this time that Captain Kendall wrote and invited Nesmick to join him on Florida's west coast. Nesmick knew and had a great respect for his fellow outdoorsman, pen named Tarpon, and so he wrote back at once to enthusiastically accept the invitation. But then a cold snap, the thermometer at 22 below zero, and, as Nesmuk described, delay succeeded delay. But finally, after a visit with his admirers at Forest and Stream and their New York City offices, Nesmuk and his bucktail boarded the steamship Tallahassee and departed for Florida at 10 minutes before midnight on the 15th of January, 1885. Two nights later, the ship found itself in a tremendous gale as it rounded Cape Hatteras, a gale that lasted nearly to Savannah. Resting off the ugliness of the last two days, Nesmick woke in the port of Savannah to find that his little lap streak canoe had been unloaded and was gone, despite he and it being booked for further passage to Fernandina, Florida. Nesmick spent two days trying to find his beloved canoe with no luck. 
He was told that it had been sent on to Cedar Keys, on Florida's west coast near his final destination. Refusing to depart with the ship, he finally agreed to rail passage in hopes of catching up to the bucktail. But, as happens still today, lost items rarely turn up easily. Nesmik went on by rail, but then learned that the canoe had not arrived at Cedar Key. Nesmik sat down at one stop and refused to go any further. But then, the next day, his canoe somehow found him. Nesmik wrote, Blessed sight, there lay the bucktail in her loveliness, as sound as the day she left Wellsboro. Making passage on the 11-ton schooner Sunrise, canoe and canoeist shortly found themselves in yet another storm, which Nesmik described as the worst qual I ever saw at sea, the worst racket I ever saw on salt water. Fortunately, the crew were expert at stripping sails until the sunrise was flying before the squall under bare poles. The next day found them at Anclody Keys, just offshore of Tarpon Springs, and the little sailing ship anchored up alongside 30 or more spongers lying two miles offshore. Instead of making for the wharf inshore, a small boat was dispatched to carry Nesmuk and four other passengers ashore. When the little boat grounded half a mile for shore and the other passengers waded their gear through the final stretch of the Gulf of Mexico, Nesmuk hopped into the little bucktail and put his double blade paddle to work up the Enclody River for the fledgling outpost of Tarpon Springs. For a journey that should have taken only five days, Nesmuk finally made his destination after two grueling weeks of travel. He said, I could have reached California in half the time, and all my clothes and camp duffel was left on board the sunrise with a solemn promise it should be landed the next day, which it wasn't. They are not particularly hurried in this region. His first day on the west coast was spent paddling up and down the winding Enclody River in search of human habitation. Not only did the river take the bucktail through all points of the compass, but its flow changed direction with the tides. These challenges came along with cold, one of the coldest Florida winters ever recorded. The Great Freeze, as it came to be called, led to the demise of multiple Florida towns, destroyed Florida's citrus crop, and pushed much further south the ranges of Florida native plants and animals. The winter of 1884 to 1885 was not what Nesmuk expected of the subtropics, but he pushed on, eventually finding a lumber mill camp up the riverbank. Hiking through the darkening landscape, he found a small hotel and a warm fire. The next day, Nesmuk met Captain Kendall, the canoeist and boat builder, for the first time down at the river. Kendall, Tarpon, at six feet two inches tall, towered over Nesmuk's five foot three inches, but the two shook hands with a hearty double-handed grip. Before inviting Nesmuk up to the house though, Kendall said, hold on, I must have a ride in the bucktail first, if it's only to beat Mrs. K. Kendall settled his 170 pounds into the small craft and enjoyed his first excursion. But Mrs. Kendall soon made amends by paddling the bucktail to the springs and back. Nesmuk remarked, She trims my canoe better and sends it along faster than I do myself. The Kendalls carved out a tidy quarters for Nesmuk in the boat building shop with a bunk and writing desk that had been held for the preceding two months awaiting his arrival. Outside, the intrepid captain and boat builder had two new sharpies, one 24 feet and the other 33 feet in length, both ready for sea. Inside the shop, next to Nesmuk's bunk, were a workbench and two skiffs under construction. That night, Nesmuk imagined casting to the yard-long redfish he had seen while paddling across the shoals, but was too tired for anything but sleep. He wrote, It was a cold night in Florida, and I crept under all the blankets I could master, 
bade the captain a sleepy good night and slept the sleep of the tired canoeist. Nesmuk spent the next week or so yearning for the wild, even wilder than the wilderness outpost that was the Kendall home and boatworks. The captain and his wife, however, kept Nesmuk in their company and paddled with him upriver to the frontier village of Tarpon Springs, its population less than 100 at the time. The villagers were excited to meet the Kendall's famous visitor, and they marveled at the little bucktail. As Nesmuk put it, the bucktail was looked upon with much curiosity, as this was the first time two double bladers had ever made landfall there. Nesmuk and his host paddled up and down the Anclody River, exploring channels and bays, and portaging overland to Salt Lake and Lake Butler. They offered colorful flies from their split bamboo rods to the naive largemouth bass, and had a grand time pulling in single fish that easily fed three people. Eventually, Nesmuk got away on his own, though, making camp under the shade of majestic gnarled live oaks on a high spot of land between the Anclody River and Salt Lake. He built himself a five-foot by seven-foot shanty from pine boards and thatched the roof with palmetto leaves. This would be his home among the alligators, ibis, deer, grouse, bear, and redfish for weeks to come. One evening as his fire burned down, he pulled out a hard coal and scratched large letters onto a clear pine board. Oak Point, February 1885, Camp Tarpon, Nesmuk. From his fresh camp, Nesmuk had a harsh introduction to paradise, but one that still pleased him immensely. Normally sunny and rain-free, this February was anything but normal. Along with the brutal cold that winter came storms very unusual for the dry season. Nesmuk wrote to his avid readers, Last evening there were thunderstorms all around me in all directions, but it was not until 10 p.m. that a heavy one struck the camp and it meant business. The furious wind drifted the rain in horizontal sheets. The lightning was fierce and incessant. The thunder a heavy article of constant quantity and excellent quality, the entire affair a display of grandeur and power, well worth turning out at midnight to see. The average outer would probably suggest that it could as well be seen in a dry skin from the windows of a comfortable hotel. And the average outer would be wrong. To thoroughly see and realize such a magnificent display, you would want to take it in as I did last night, where, by the vivid flashes, you can look far down the vistas of writhing pines and the long gray beards of century oaks. It was magnificent, but a little damp. Nesmuk lived a half-hunter, half-hermit life for 46 days in his shanty overlooking Salt Lake, then more at a second camp, signing off his letters to Forest and Stream from Camp Tarpon, or from Oak and Pine. He paddled into Tarpon Springs periodically, and picked up mail, which often included newspapers from home. But he did not read them, simply saving them all for the Kendalls to digest the news of the world as they saw fit. Nesmuk said that as time passed leisurely by, he lost all sense of the days of the week and the days of the month, and that even his watch caught the infection of laziness, first failing to keep accurate time, then finally declining to function altogether. But he was not worried with time. He hunted and fished as need be, often taking game only three or four days a week to sustain himself. He grew to admire and even love some of his former quarry. Of the two bevies of quail that visited his camp each day, Nesmuk said, At first I was a little disposed to utilize them as food, but on watching their cute, beautiful ways, my heart failed me. They were so graceful on the ground or on the wing that 
I decided to leave them in peace, believing that I could get more enjoyment from them alive than dead. And I did. And then there were the fearless crows that joined Camp Tarpon. At first he fed them, but then he changed his mind, referring to them as senseless, incorrigible thieves. They apparently stole just for fun, he said, taking dish rags, soaps, and teaspoons, until Nesmuk unloaded on them a shotgun shell that he had packed with gunpowder and sand. The crows did not return. Longing for new experiences in his southern paradise, in mid-March, Nesmuk carried down to Salt Lake, then crossed over into the uncharted Lake Butler, today known as Lake Tarpon. The next morning, Kendall joined him, and together they explored the larger lake, some two miles across and six and a half miles long, home to no humans. Nesmuk called it a crystal gem in an emerald setting of pine and palm. Filled with herons and flowing plumage, pink-hued spoonbills, cormorants and snake-necked anhingas, the lake was also a fishing paradise. During their day exploring the lake, Kendall collected birds for specimens, while Nesmuk caught fish for the night's supper. The next morning, with more fish and coffee to start the day, the two outdoor partners began exploring this new wilderness in detail. The pair set out through a swamp, but their goal of heading homeward that day was thwarted when Kendall's rag canoe snagged and began taking on water. They made for shore, built a fire, and commenced repairs with bits of canvas and wax, melted on a fire-heated axe head. Kendall opined, the beauty of a rag canoe is that she is so easily repaired. To which Nesmuk replied, The beauty of a clinker-built canoe is that she takes ten times the amount of snagging and don't need any mending at all. I should point out what a, a rag canoe is and a clinker-built canoe. This is a clinker-built canoe. It's all wood, lap straight, and you nail together the various boards to, to make it watertight. And, and Nesmuk is a big fan of this type of canoe. It's what he paddles. A rag canoe, I don't know if you know, you may have paddled them yourself, um, but they're cedar canvas canoes. They have ribs and they have planking, but then the outside is covered with, uh, with a heavy canvas that's waterproofed and painted. Um, great canoe, but, but as Nesmuk points out, they can get snagged on something. You tear the canvas and now they're going to leak, and that's exactly what happened to Kendall's canoe. So basically, they're sitting here in the middle of nowhere in Florida in 1885, debating the merits of these two types of canoes in a, in a place filled with alligators and, and snakes and all sorts of good things. Kendall countered that the clinker-built canoe costs twice as much as his canvas canoe, to which Nesmuk ended that the lap-straight canoe lasts four times as long and will float a man when she is swamped. Good-natured debate between friends passed the time as the canoe's patch set up. Nesmuk said that he came to Florida to cruise in his canoe, not to fish and hunt, though he did these two as required to sustain himself. Already established as an ardent supporter of game laws and conservation, he was dismayed sometimes at the behavior of visitors to the hamlet of Tarpon Springs. One day, a party of four hotel guests took 260 pounds of bass and sea trout. When he asked what they planned to do with so many fish, they answered that they would use as much as they could and give the rest to anyone who would take them away. One fisherman remarked, You see, there was a lady in the party who caught over 60 pounds. You wouldn't like to be beaten by a lady, would you? To which Nesmuk replied, Yes. I am willing to be beaten by anyone, man or woman, who shoots or fishes for slaughter. Near the end of his Florida camp stay, Nesmuk one morning heard a cart clattering up from the river towards the Kendall home. On the cart was a large box originating from Canton, New York, containing a fantastic surprise. By the time Nesmuk reached the home of his friends, the box was already open to reveal two delicate Rushton canoes. Mrs. Tarpon was, according to Nesmuk, 
actually dancing with delight like an excited schoolgirl. Her new lapstrake canoe was slightly smaller than the bucktail, and inside this one was yet a smaller canoe, the new Rushton Fairbanks, eight and a half feet long and 23 inches beam. At only nine pounds, 15 ounces, Nesmick balanced her on the end of one finger. Mrs. Kendall paddled her little canoe up and down the river, and when she finally pulled out, she exclaimed, Oh, she is just lovely, worth half a dozen spring bonnets. Soon, Mrs. Kendall headed north to be with family for the summer, leaving her prized canoe hanging in the sitting room of their home. With the addition of this one and the Fairbanks, Nesmuk and Tarpon had a total of five canoes for their use, including Nesmuk's bucktail and Kendall's two canvas canoes. In that same sitting room, Nesmuk and Tarpon planned to deck the light Rushton Fairbanks canoe with canvas, load it and the bucktail onto Kendall's newly built Sharpie, and set sail for new waters and newer adventures in the even wilder Thousand Islands of extreme southwest Florida. Nesmuk's health continued to decline over the next few years, and he died May 1st of 1890. In a short note dated August 23, 1890, his nostalgic friend Kendall wrote to Forest and Stream. Sixteen years ago, a dray man drove up to Tarpon Ranch with two canoes and one box, the Smarty weighing 16 pounds and the Rushton weighing in at 9 pounds 15 ounces. The Rushton was carried by Nesmuk. The other canoe has been paddled by Mrs. Tarpon. The Rushton got back to Tarpon Ranch again and is snuggled up alongside the Smarty, as ready for the water as the day they were taken out of the box 16 years ago. Poor old Nesmuk. The sight of the little 10-pounder calls back the many pleasant cruises we have had together. May he have a better canoe in the happy hunting ground. Before the end of the same year, Captain Samuel D. Kendall also would be gone. Despite his poor health, Nesmuk made it to just shy of 70 years, Kendall to 61. Both adventurers survived well past the average life expectancy of the time, which was only in the mid-40s. Perhaps because of the clean woods life they espoused, and perhaps because they both chose to live their convictions. Nesmuk once described drifting off to dreamland and his wild Florida camp with Kendall at his side. Having swapped yarns until a late hour, we drew our blankets around us, and there came the old, familiar voices of the night. Voices familiar, yet unknown. Voices that I knew fifty years ago, but the owners of which have always been, to me, a mystery. Today, the voice of Nesmuk still resonates through the years. His deep and abiding love of the outdoors, always fresh and clear. And at least some of those little Rushton canoes still dance on waters today. Alrighty. <clears throat> so that's that. So. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and by the way, this is a brand new copy of Woodcraft, which Nesmuk produced in the 1880s, still published today, still very popular today. And this is a copy of Rushton's 1883 boat and canoe catalog. And then there are other catalogs from Rushton. This is a 1903 catalog, still in print today because they're, they're not made anymore. But people love these so much that there's, there's just this, this, this mystique, this mythos, this legend about Rushton and about Nesmuk. And so um, the, among people like me who enjoy these old boats, 
There's nothing that gets people more excited than a Rushton. If anybody hears the name Rushton, they, you know, they, their mouths drop open. They quietly say, where, 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 you know. So um, this is one example of his work here. The one we believe that, uh, that Nesmuk actually paddled here in Florida. But he built a wide variety of things from tiny little canoes like this to big motor launches, uh, steam powered. Oh, and one thing I want to point out is this, it, you're welcome to come up and check it out, really look at the canoe, but, um, uh, and this is not, this is a simple canoe by his standards. He built some very, very fine, uh, bigger craft with all sorts of hardware and things that, um, and double-masted sailing canoes for competitive racing, all sorts of wonderful things. All of this was done, at least in the beginning during these days, before they even had electricity. And the workmanship, the craftsmanship, is amazing. It's just astounding. People are hard-pressed to do what he did back in the 1800s today with all the power tools and, and modern conveniences. They didn't even have electric lights. So um, anyway, um, I was going to say something else about that. But um, so when, when putting this together, um, I, I spent a lot of time reading through uh, Nesmuk's writing in Forest and Stream and elsewhere. I read all of the stories that um, found old copies of the journals and was able to read those in his own words from those days. The writing is very dense, it's very hard to read. And the quotes that I pulled out, you know, I, I pulled them because I think they're really representative of him and how he, he operated, how he thought, how he felt about the outdoors, plus they're, they're relatively accessible. But one good example, I love the quote about the storm and, you know, staying up past midnight to see this amazing storm. And he talks about the long gray beards of the century oaks. You know, that's the, the Spanish moss, right? And just a beautiful, beautiful way of, of describing what he saw and, and his love for the outdoors. So um, these are sort of things that attract me and hopefully you enjoy them as well. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Anyone? Yes. What is the, uh, the weight of that canoe? You know, I get that all the time, and I still haven't weighed it. <laughs> That's but the 10-pounder with a canvas. Uh, no, it was also built this way as well. And so that's one of the things that helped make these two such an extraordinary pair and helped make them mutually even more famous than they were. Both Rushton and Nesmuk were very small men. Both had respiratory problems. In fact, uh, Rushton actually did what he did because he didn't want to work in the cities. He tried his hand at other things and, and he really suffered, you know, working in mines or in cities. But anyway, they were both small, they were both frail, and so they kind of played off of each other and they, they built these ever smaller and lighter canoes. And you know, every time they built you know another one, they would say, can't possibly be any smaller or any lighter. It'll literally fall apart. But they never did. And again, this one, um, I didn't have to do a tremendous amount of work to restore it, and it's well over a hundred years old. So Truly fine craftsmanship. Yes. This I found it uh, in St. Augustine. Um, it, it had been over on the west coast in the area of Tarpon Springs, and was picked up by a um, an antique dealer some years ago, and they just kept it for for years. That couple had another family in the antiques business over on the east coast, St. Augustine, and um, when the the couple that originally found this boat, when the man died. His wife was trying to liquidate everything, and some of the things went to his friends in St. Augustine. And so that's where I found it was, was through this woman who lived in St. Augustine. And it, um, it was total happenstance. I was actually headed to New York, of all places, northern New York. Um, Tanya and I were going to an annual gathering of wooden canoe nuts in, in upstate New York. The night before I left, I think that year, I was driving up with a couple of boats, and um, Tanya and our son River were going to fly up, or maybe he was away. Anyway, I left by myself, and, uh, but the night before I was to leave, first thing in the morning, I found out about this canoe. Somebody said it had been advertised for about a month. No way it was still there. No way it was. I saw the photo and said, oh, and I started shaking. I knew what it was. <laughs> and uh, so the next morning, oh, I sent her a message. I had an email address. Didn't expect to get any response. If I did get a response, it would be, no, it's long gone. But she did get back to me that night, and she said, yes, I still have it. It's here. I said, I'm going to be passing your way tomorrow morning. She said, stop by. And the short of it is, within 10 hours of finding out about it, I had it and was super excited. <laughs> 
neither one of us truly knew. I told her it was special. I said, I said, I'm absolutely sure it's made by this famous builder upstate New York. Told her a little story about it and offered her more money than she, was, uh, than she advertised it for, which was a steal in my opinion. And she said, nope. She said, it's what I priced it at. And, um, and I didn't know all of this history at the time. It took some time to really figure out the, the, you know, the back story behind it. But yeah. Yes, sir. Good question. What wood are they made of? Primarily these old boats, the hulls, are, they tend to be made of cedar, uh, northern white cedar, and the reason is it's a very lightweight wood. It's somewhat resinous, so it's, it's fairly rot resistant, which again is why it lasted so long. And then some of the trim on this one is either butternut or um, uh, uh, white oak. White oak is also very rot resistant, so it's a great wood for these sorts of things. It's heavier. And so on these really tiny ones, he tried to make the trim, the, the, the things that needed to be really tough. Um, oak is a much tougher wood than, than white cedar. He tried to use as, as little of that as he could. Um, so this one is primarily, oh, the ribs are red elm. Uh, red elm, these boat builders were amazing. They really studied the properties of wood. And, uh, and this has not been improved upon in all these years. Red elm is really great because it, it, it steam bends well, but it's an extremely tough wood. In fact, you can't just nail through it, it'll split like crazy, so you have to carefully drill holes and put the fasteners through those holes. But, but anyway, they use the red elm for the ribs in the canoe, lots of tiny little ribs, because that's what gives the hull its strength. And then the, the, the planking, the laps on the side, are cedar, very rot resistant. Trim is white oak, also very rot resistant and very tough. Um, other canoes you'll find, and, and not just canoes, but small boats, wooden boats, They'll be made with uh, cherry sometimes, which is not terribly rot resistant, but it's stunningly beautiful, so you, they use it. And the same with mahogany. You'll find genuine mahogany from the old days, uh, Central American, Caribbean mahogany that is, uh, especially at 100 years old, it's exquisite, just gorgeous. And then I guess the only other common wood that you see in these boats is Spanish cedar, which is, uh, uh, it's not a cedar, but it's uh, from, from Central South America. It's also great boat building wood. Fasteners, yes. In this one, the fasteners are almost all copper, some brass. Uh, these were the common things in the day, again, because they're relatively corrosion resistant, at least in fresh water. Brass is not great in salt water, but most of these canoes were built for, for fresh water. Screws yeah. or nails? So in this type of construction, uh, the question was screws or nails. In this type of construction, they, the, the way they built these is they had a, a canoe-shaped form. It's really just sort of cutouts, like little, and, and it's upside down, so it looked like a series of little mushrooms. And on those forms, they would build, sometimes they were solid forms, but canoe-shaped form anyway. And they would um, sometimes bend the ribs onto the form or sometimes bend the planking on the form. If they, bend, if they bend the ribs first, then they nail on the planking. If they bend the planking first, they nail it together, and then they put the ribs in afterward. But anyway, so, so it's sort of a two-part process, ribs and planking. And the way you fasten those together is, in these small boats, is a process called clinch nailing. So these are very sharp, very fine um, copper nails or tacks that go in. And on the inside, you have a piece of metal so that when they hit that metal, they, the tip of it curls into the wood and clinches into the wood, and it makes a permanent fastening. It's, like, like a rivet. In fact, some of these boats were actually built with rivets as well. So you'd put a little copper nail through and put a little rove or a washer of copper over that, clip it off, and sort of hammer the thing down. So a variety of different construction styles, but uh, most common in the small boats is this sort of clinch nailing process. Um, and by the way, that's all there is. It's the wood, the fasteners, and varnish. Nothing else. And still watertight after 130-something years. I just want to know if you'd like to share with the audience how you go about researching places that you'd like to build communities, let's say in the south. Oh, how, how do I go about researching places that I would like to go canoeing in the southeast? Most of the time I'm driving along and I see water and I say, I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> the more jungly, the better. I tell you what, the wilder, the better. I love it. But I do, you know, I'll... Uh, I spend a lot of time on the internet, I, you know, look for waterways. I, I just look at maps and try to find things that are as remote as I can find. Um, there are some guides that will tell you where some really great rivers are. 
to paddle in Florida. Uh, so I spend a lot of time with those as well. Um, and I've, I, I've had the good fortune to canoe not just in the southeast, but all the way you know, into Canada and over to the west coast, up in Washington, that area, in South America, in Australia, all sorts of fun places. And the more crocodiles and snakes, and oh, the better. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. so, so there, there is a, so my interest, I mean, I love anything, I, I love Native American history as well. I'm absolutely fascinated by it. But for some reason, my interest in these, these wooden boats tends to be in this period from basically mid-1800s to the early 1900s when this was really in its, in its flower and the industry was really growing and changing. One of the interesting things about that is that uh, all of this derives from Native American history. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. It, it, it derives from European history and Native American history. Europeans were already building big, you know, seafaring vessels, you know, built with wooden planks on big uh, timbers, ribs, essentially. Um, and that came to this country. In fact, this style of construction is most reminiscent of that European tradition. But remember, Kendall and Nesmuk were arguing back and forth over which was better, the clinker-built canoe or the rag canoe, the canvas-covered canoe. The canvas-covered canoe comes directly from the birch bark canoe. The way they're built is you bend ribs onto a form, and then you nail planking onto that, but the planking is not watertight at all on that type. And then you stretch canvas over it and nail it around the edges, and you fill the weave with some waterproofing material and paint it. A birch bark is exactly the same thing, except built in the reverse order. They make a shell of birch bark, lay the planking inside, and then put the ribs in to give everything its strength. So it's ribs, planking, and an exterior covering, just like the cedar canvas canoe. The people who invented the cedar canvas canoe, they invented it because they were trying to improve on the birch bark canoe, which is still a wonderful craft. Um, and then finally, there's a whole other tradition of boat building in especially southern, southeastern Canada and the northeastern U.S. that has its background in Native American dugouts. So they actually, early settlers in Canada, you, you get, there's this, this region in the northern U.S. and very southern part of Canada where good big birch trees grew very well. That's where you find birch bark canoes. Further north, dugouts. Further south, dugouts. As far as I'm aware, there, there never was a big tradition of modern boat building that came out of southern dugouts, although you could, you could argue maybe Piro's and you know, some of the southern boats may derive from those. But certainly above the birch line up in Canada, they built a different style of canoe that was based very much on, on the dugout. The shapes are like dugouts. They actually used dugouts originally as the molds to build their boats on. So there's a really rich history of all these kinds of boat building. But yeah, the dugout here in the south, um, we probably all know they were very common. Huge, anywhere from small little boats for personal use to giant boats for river travel and sending goods up and down rivers. Really an amazing history here in the south. Mm -hmm. How were you able to acquire the uh, history on that particular canoe? How do you know it's his and so forth? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be completely honest. I do not know for absolute certain. What I do know is these are extraordinarily rare. I know of one other in North America, and it's up in the Northeast. Um, based upon what it is, where it was found, and the care that I'm sure they gave to it, we, we like to think that this is the one, but in all honesty, there's no way we can possibly know that this is the one. There are no serial numbers, even if there were, Rushton didn't keep records of that sort, or at least we don't have them today. So, yes. From your um, studies in Silver Stream and so forth, um, do you feel that he credited having better health in his later years to paddling in Florida? Uh, he, well, I, I haven't read him saying exactly that, but, but more generally, yes. He goes on and on in his writings about the restorative powers of the outdoors. Um, just uh, that, That's one of his favorite subjects. 
because it was so important to him. He would have been dead years before. I, I think there's no question if he didn't have these, time, uh, these times outdoors, whether it were in the North or the South. But, uh, but yeah, he talks a lot about that. And a lot of these people from that day did. You know, this was an industrial age and, um, you know, all these people working, toiling so hard in the cities where there was a lot of soot and a lot of disease. You know, it was really important for people to get out. And that's really why this whole industry flourished. Um, some people call these small boats, especially the sailing ones, they call them the poor man's yacht. And, and this kind of language is all about the idea that you want to, when you have free time, you want to get out of the city or at least get out somewhere, if it, even if it's close to the city, get out somewhere in nature and enjoy yourself. And so canoes became hugely popular in this era. A little bit south of them, there's Mayaka River. Have you done? Mm -hmm. Mayaka River is beautiful. Yeah. Most of these rivers in Florida are just gorgeous. Even the ones that run through city, the Hillsborough River, yeah. you know, runs through Tampa. There are a lot of parts of the Hillsborough River. You'd never know there's a house right behind those trees. It's gorgeous. Oh, no, no, they're up north. So, so those weren't my photos. Well, one of them, can't remember. If, I think one of them. But yeah, they're, they're from their home places up north. Yeah. Oh, no, no, what am I saying? Yes, I did take one of them. Rushed, uh, Nesmuk's, I'm thinking, Nes I'm thinking Rushton. Nesmuk's photo, uh, the photo of Nesmuk's grave, someone else took that. That's in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, where he is from. The photo of Kendall's grave, I made that one in Tarpon Springs. He is in the, the main old graveyard over there in Tarpon Springs and occupies this huge and beautiful section of the, the cemetery there. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, where the photos transitioned from black and white to color, was that his photo and then yours or <laughs> yours that was black and white? That's mine that I just took the color away from and okay. then transferred in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was fun. I hope I didn't do it too much, but it was fun. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Is there another version of the seat that might be more comfortable? Um, so again, he's building the lightest possible boat that he can. So there are no thwarts, these cross pieces that hold it together like you'd see in a bigger canoe. And, and in a bigger and less well-built canoe, if you don't have those cross members, the whole thing just spreads apart over time. And that's another testament to how well this is built. But to use it, you know, you, you, know, you want to be comfortable to some degree anyway. And these really are designed to sit down low. They're, they're, it's a round bottom. It's very unstable. But I think of it like a bike. You know, you learn how to ride a bike. You know how to ride a bike. You know how to keep your stability. Same here. But you still, you want to have a low center of gravity or you're going to go over. And so what Rushton did was build these little folding seats that you could easily stow away and put in the boat when you wanted to. And no, they're not terribly comfortable, but he also sold um, cushions and backrest cushions that you could put in there as well. I'm quite sure Nesmuk did not carry all of that on these great adventures, but he was a, a tough, wiry little fellow, so he probably didn't need any of that. This one, actually, my wife was, she asked me to go out and get it because it's so heavy. I made that seat. It's a replica of an original that I found. But he had another type. I replicated it, but I left it elsewhere, so couldn't bring it. But it's made of cherry, and it's a whole lot lighter because it's made of slats and not solid wood. So he found ways to lighten up everything that he could. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, some of the boats I find, they are wrecks. I mean, I've had people say, are you crazy? No way that thing will ever float again. But, um, you know, I have a friend uh, who's done this for a living for about 40 years, and he says, if I have one rib, I can build a canoe around it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this one was in really remarkable shape. It was all there. It was all together. Some of the parts were sort of sprung loose. Um, there was some, uh, um, um, what do you call it? carpenter ant damage in one of the decks. But I, I really did everything I could to save every bit of the original material possible. So it's about 99.9% .9 original. Yeah. Sometimes you're lucky. Yes. Could you comment on the oars? Yeah, so, so good question. This, this didn't come with this boat, but this is typical 
for what they would use back in those days. In fact, there was a picture of Mrs. Kendall holding something like this. So they, now we would call this a kayak paddle, but they've been used forever for this type of boat. And any, when you're in a small boat like this where you can easily reach both sides and you're down low, this is really a great means of propulsion. In fact, uh, there was a, a quote from Nesmuk in there where he said something about this was the first time two double bladers had landed at Tarpon Springs. This is what's meant by a double blader. So, and this one, this is an antique. It was uh, made in upstate New York probably back in the late 1800s as well. So, yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, your, your first question, I noticed my wife really perked up, you know, because she's always interested in what are you going to do with these things. We have a huge collection of these things, probably the largest anywhere outside of a couple of museums. So <laughs> the short answer is, I don't know. We're, we're, we have one child, and I don't think he really wants to be saddled with all of this someday. So I'm already thinking about it, but I don't have a good answer. <laughs> so... Um, Animal adventures? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, are there, I, are, there, there are a couple of canoe museums. There, there are a variety of maritime museums, uh, and they have boats of all sorts, including small boats. Um, uh, Mystic Connecticut, for example. Uh, there's one up on the St. Lawrence River. So a variety of these. Uh -huh. But then in Peterborough, Ontario, which I mentioned these Canadian canoes that were built basically from the, the birch bark tradition. Peterborough, Ontario, is the center of that industry. Like Old Town, Maine is the center of canoe building in the U.S. And in Peterborough, they have an amazing museum. Unbelievable. I mean, if you're not even into this sort of thing, oh, you would be astounded. It, it's fabulous. I've heard people who have no interest go there and just, wow, wow, wow. And then there's another one in uh, a tiny little town called Spooner, Wisconsin. And these two are dedicated almost exclusively to canoes. Oh man, I get that question all the time. How much are these things worth? How much is this worth? I wouldn't begin to know how to put a number on it. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's so historic. Like I said, even, you know, we can't know for sure that this is the very one, but I know this world. I'm deeply immersed in this world. I've only ever seen one other. So it's just hard to say. Um, I can tell you some of the others that we have that, that are regularly traded, you know, they can go 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. I've seen them go 20,000. Just depends on the maker, the rarity, the age, the condition, you know, like any other antique. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> Which one? Which story? Oh my gosh, of course you, see I knew she was going to remember ones that involve her. Um, well, so that one, we, I don't know, I shouldn't tell this one, hope it doesn't sound self-aggrandizing, but it was pretty cool. We, we had moved, um, we, I was in grad school, and we had moved out to Kansas City, and you know, Kansas, we were like, last place on earth we wanted to live. But of course, the first thing we did was seek out any kind of natural area. And we found this beautiful park that had a beautiful lake. And the canoe that, that we had built um, while I was a grad student, we had with us. And we loved to go out all the time, you know, wherever we could paddling. So first thing we did when we got to Kansas City was put in and go paddling at this lake. And we've never lived in the Midwest before. And so there are all these great animals that we've never seen before. One of my favorite animals in the southeast is the painted turtle. If you don't know the painted turtle, they're a small freshwater turtle and they are just beautiful, beautiful. Kind of a dark chocolate brown on top with a little bit of red striping, but the underneath and the skin on the neck and the legs light up with red and yellow. I mean, they are gorgeous, love them. There's a different painted turtle in the Midwest. So of course, I'm all about that. Well, the first time we went out on this lake in Shawnee Mission Park, we're paddling along. <laughs> And Tanya's, this canoe has seats, and it's about 17 and a half feet long. And um, Tanya's up front. I'm in the rear, so she can't tell what I'm doing. And we're just paddling along. We're probably in water, I don't know, seven feet deep or so. 
and all of a sudden I see this turtle just like lightning underwater. The water is very clear and it's just shooting through the water. And, um, and I recognize it instantly as a painted turtle. So what do you do? Well, you dive in, right? <laughs> I don't, it was like, like a reflex. I just, I, I didn't even think about it. I stood up and dived in. <laughs> And Tanya tells me she is freaking out. She doesn't know what's going on. The boat's going crazy, and she's just about to fall out. And she said the most amazing thing was, you came up with the turtle in your hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, I had my really nice 35-millimeter camera outfit in the canoe. So, But, yeah, there was another time that, that involves photography, too. It's not so much canoeing, but I was, I was paddling with a friend of mine through the Okefenokee um, not too many years ago. And I had this, this really nice, uh, if you do photography, polarizing filters, you know, really nice. And a circular polarizer is particularly nice and particularly expensive. And I had this really nice circular polarizer. And I'm standing on a log out over the water. Not a log. It was an old dock from ages ago. And it was almost gone. And I had made my way out there for some reason, trying to get a photo of an alligator or something. And, um, and I decided I, need, I either need to put it on or take it off. But one way or another, I dropped this filter into the water. And that water, you know, they call it black water for a reason. It's, you can't see. And I mean, I just heard it bloop. And I said, oh, oh no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I carefully made my way back to the shore, put my camera down, and went in. And there's a huge alligator right there. There's one over there. There's one over there. And my friend is like, you're not serious. I'm like, do you know how much that filter cost? <laughs> and so I, I, had to, I had no choice. I just wanted my filter back. <laughs> so I just dove down, and, and you can't see a thing, so I just had to feel around, and I'll be darned if I didn't get it. And, you know, it was about, I don't know, seven, eight feet deep there, and it was all right. There was one here, yes. Um, from what I see very well, I love this thing. It's, it's so historic. It's so delicate. Um, I haven't been in it myself, but I got my neighbor's 10-year-old daughter to go out and paddle it so I could get some photographs. And It looks like it, it's great on the water. <laughs> I'd love to try it myself. Yeah, the, the question is, could you match it up to some old photos? The photos, I mean, I trust me, I zoom in and I analyze them. To, and I haven't been able to yet, um, fingers crossed. Um, they're just so grainy and, you know, not great quality. So I don't want to keep you guys too late. One more real quick. And, How many of those models would he have made? Oh, gosh, there's really no way to know. That's a good question. How many would he have made? His catalog lists countless variety. Everything that he dreamed up, he put into his catalog, and he would make it for people. Um, I don't, we don't even know what his output was. He died in 1906. So they're really, there's, it's so long gone, we just don't know. Rustins of any kind are extremely rare, extremely rare. You see Old Town's 200 before you find a Rushton easy, maybe 500. So not many, but how many? I wish we knew. I wish we knew. So in case anybody needs to get going, um, we'll call it quits. But please feel free to come up. You can check out the literature and the boat itself and talk more. Thank you.